thank you for inviting me. Uh, and uh, if I may, I think you should support this type of series of lectures. Um, because in uh, ATEU Vienna, we're desperately trying to have something similar and not managing so far. So uh, I, I think it's good to, to have a, a moment of opening of the uh, school uh, towards uh, the outside. Uh, and I think it's nice that it happens all together. It's kind of a little celebration in itself. Uh, so I was asked uh, to talk about books and buildings. And so I thought, OK. Maybe I can talk about books and buildings, uh, which are things that we uh, are doing uh, with no uh, specific uh, um, attempt at coordinating the two activities. So books are something we do, uh, and buildings are also something we do. Uh, there's no direct link in between the two, although, of course, there are some uh, overlappings and, uh, and books are, to a certain extent, also, at least in our case, precondition uh, to, to do architecture. So, in, um, I believe in 2000, I don't even remember when we published this thing, I don't know, in 2000. 12, maybe. Um, we published this book uh, that is a collection of two essays, uh, one dedicated to, um, uh, to the work of the Italian architect Giorgio Grassi and one dedicated to uh, the architecture of the city, uh, so the first book uh, by Aldo Ross. And these two books, uh, these two texts somehow came together uh, and, this, uh, and this is really contrary to all of the rest that, that I will show you, uh, which has been uh, written uh, by myself alone. Uh, this has really been written with uh, my colleagues in the office, uh, which also means that it's a bit more tormented and, and uh, to say, <coughs> slow and probably also more less easy to read um, but this was really important uh, for us to, to put together uh, to discuss actually the way we uh, produce uh, architecture uh, and and on on this level I would say the the Giorgio Grassi essay which is the most boring and the most uh, uh, difficult to read is actually the most important. And I think it's so boring and so difficult uh, exactly because it's the important thing. And once that has been sort of um, defined, uh, the rest can also be a little bit more enjoyable and easy. And, um, and the reason why we, we <coughs> discuss the work of, uh, of Giorgio Grassi, who, who is uh, not necessarily a uh, super famous Italian architect of the 70s, who is nowadays still alive, uh, is that Grassi, <laughs> of all these ar architects grouped around Rossi, has been the most radical in defining a way of uh, approaching the architecture of the past as a sort of resource that could be reused to produce uh, contemporary architecture. And, and Grassi remained, did, didn't have the sort of um, second pop, second phase of the career that, that, as it happened in the case of Rossi, in which Rossi became famous and started to design coffee pot and uh, these sort of things. Uh, Grassi remained very, very dry and very, very abstract. And, um, and exactly because of that, he, he developed uh, a, a very consistent and, in our opinion, useful intellectual position uh, that we thought could be, um, to a certain extent, re-employed in, in a rather pragmatic way. 
So this is a bit that uh, what we were doing, uh, and together with that, we were doing this sort of things like uh, a uh, housing block, housing. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can call it tower, uh, if your expectation from tower are very limited, um, in Tirana, in Albania, or these um, exhibition design that is actually a bit later for Auser and Wirt for Fries London, or these competitions for a uh, church in Norway or pavilion, <coughs> uh, ex Italian Expo pavilion, uh, at Shanghai Expo, and we were doing researches and also producing objects like this uh, Foucault's pendulum, uh, which is at Palazzo della Ragione in, uh, in Padua. And the Foucault pendulum is a, um, it's a machine, it's a scientific machinery that demonstrates something that I don't know. Uh, about the oscillation of whatever axis of the planet. Um, but the problem is that if this uh, pendulum is touched by someone, uh, whatever it demonstrates, it doesn't demonstrate anymore. So you need to protect the pendulum from visitors and in particular kids. And, um, and so we designed this very big sort of pan it's a very simple, autonomous figure who could be readable uh, and survive inside of an uh, extremely exuberant uh, artistic, uh, like inside of a masterpiece like Palazzo della Ragione. And, um, and probably you see here an attitude toward form, like in trying to read a form out of the context and to put it there. Uh, as clear and as autonomous as possible, but also as simple as possible, uh, that probably you will see again uh, reappearing in, in other circumstances, while well, other stuff we were doing more or less at the time. Um, and then at a certain moment we uh, won competition for a archive in Milan, an archive dedicated to five different and very different uh, associations linked to uh, Italian, uh, Milanese and Italian uh, post-war uh, history. So these, and among these associations, the most important thing is that one of the five associations is the association of former partisan fighters in World War II who for a very complicated series of reasons that uh, I, I cannot explain now, uh, decided not to give up their archives to the Italian state because they didn't trust uh, the Italian state. So they still have very precious letters in between very important political figures in Italian history like Longo or Nene and, and so forth. Um, so this is a collection uh, that, that, that should go inside the building and it's a collection that is very precious but at the same time very unspectacular because basically it's pieces of paper with written uh, documents. So what we imagined to do in this case uh, was to, uh, to really build the archive as a document of collective uh, memory and as, a, as an object that could resist. Uh, here I have only pictures of the model in front of the cathedral at 4.30 in the morning. That's the one and only moment in which the square looks like this. Um, and uh, so we, we tried really to build a monument and once again very simple uh, thing made of bricks with these pictures that are made with sort of pixels uh, of, in six tones of brick. Um, and then after that, we probably jump to a little bit more um, complex and also bigger type of uh, um, 
architecture problems and, uh, and well, but very simply, we were invited to a slightly bigger competition, uh, like in this case, uh, it's a competition for uh, this area uh, called Scalofarini, uh, which is the biggest uh, redevelopment area in Milan. Um, Scalofarini uh, was part of a system of uh, interchange and logistic platforms uh, around the city, uh, connected to the central uh, rail station uh, and with different figures. Uh, they are now useless uh, and so they will be redeveloped. Uh, there, there are several, and uh, but Farini is the biggest. And Farini is... Uh, does this thing work? No, of course. Uh, <laughs> ah, no, yes, it works, amazing. So, this is the main, so this is the plan, uh, the so-called Beruto plan, that is the expansion of Milan at the end of the 19th century, in the, when Milan started to be part of the unitarian Italian state. Um, and uh, so you see still the old station, that was a station which you can cross. Now the station is here, and it's just a kind of a station, a terminal station. Uh, and these are the other places that were then later used uh, for the railway. You see the railway that's going all around uh, the city. Uh, and this is Scalofarini. And Scalofarini is separated from the center and looks very remote from the rest of the city. Not only because of the railway, but because in between the so-called city center and, and the place is this gigantic uh, cemetery. Uh, cemetery that you see here. So this is the cemetery and this is Scalofani. And this is the facade of the cemetery. So that stands in front of the city center, really like the beginning of the end, like the beginning of the city of the dead. And behind that, there's nothing. Um, in reality, the, uh, the cemetery is uh, quite an interesting urban feature because it's now more than 150 years old. So there's big trees and it's uh, actually sort of a park uh, that could be used in um, many different ways. And uh, what is interesting is that while um, Scalofarini that you see here is completely, or here, is completely shapeless, the um, the cemetery is, is cut by the railway, so it's incomplete, but somehow um, has sort of a failure. So by combining the two, it would be possible to have a much bigger park, uh, performing also better in environmental terms in trying to reduce the, uh, the heat that in uh, uh, Milan in summer is really uh, horrible. Uh, and providing a sort of logic at the uh, a scale of the entire city. So we thought that it was possible to design the, the new park as a complementary part of the, of the cemetery and to produce one la very large uh, urban figure, a little bit like this, Neo, famous neoclassical urban figure of, uh, of Milan uh, and something that could find a position in this system of objects like uh, Parco Sempione, Parco, Porta Venezia, this new park and the park around the San Siro Stadium that is the same here. And, uh, and so have a little bit this um, scale and recognizability of other elements of the um, of the neoclassical city and because of the size of this massive tree uh, 
contribute reducing probably half uh, grade uh, temperature in summer, which is probably even too much uh, as an estimate because it's very difficult to reduce um, one degree, but uh, at least it could contribute. Uh, this is a, um, and around that, uh, all, all of the built, the, like the massive amount of built uh, matter that was necessary for for the competition was organized. So you see these towers uh, next uh, to these elements, but uh, I don't think it's necessary to to discuss this in detail. Uh, these are photos by Stefano Graziani, who's an Italian photographer we normally work with. And this is a model for this competition and photos are taken at uh, uh, the Archivio Storico, uh, Archivio di Stato in Milan. That's another thing that we often do. And this is a, a little bit the uh, uh, the park in the system of other parks uh, and the uh, relation to infrastructure in Milan. And, uh, and the system was connected by this path here. So this is the facade of the cemetery and it's possible to go up to a terrace on top of the border uh, up to there and there it was possible to add a bridge and cross to the other side which meant uh, simply reusing this uh, terrace, already existing and very large and very beautiful because you're walking in between the, uh, the tree, um, uh, the, 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 how you call that, the, the part with the, the, with the leaves of the, of the tree, not the trunk, the other thing. Um, so, and this is a bit how this thing would look like. And you see, once again, it's, a, it's quite a simple gesture that tries to reconfigure uh, things. And, uh, and then there are the yeah, massive towers here, very big blocks there, and an headquarter of the region there, some other housing there. So. Um, we lost the competition to OMA. Which is not funny. I don't understand why you think it's funny. Um, and uh, this is a bit of the thing. Um, other thing we, we did is this pavilion uh, for brewery. Italian, uh, old Italian brewery that was bought by Carlsberg uh, some 10 years ago and then underwent the process of rebranding and through the rebranding they decided they, they need a little bit of a entry pavilion that could look a little bit better and the entry pavilion looks like this um, the uh, once again the form is very simple it's also very rough it's made to survive in this quite tough uh, uh, industrial landscape. Uh, to the, the, there are these large tanks for um, cleaning and, uh, the, the, uh, the, the leftover, the debris of the process of beer making. So this thing is also smelling. Um, and so the building is uh, at the same time, very simple, but also to a certain extent mysterious, at least in this uh, picture. Um, and it's this cylinder with a cone on the top that is simply chopped in the middle. And in the middle, there's this chimney of um, um, covered with tiles with the logo of the, the company. And inside is this, the building is entirely built in wood and it's, uh, it has one of those very high sustainability standard, which I should remember, but I don't remember. Um, whatever, uh, lead uh, zero or minus one or minus two, whatever. Um, and, uh, and it's, 
a little bit inspired of, of all the different things by this extremely beautiful hunting casino by Schenker with this chimney with the deer antlers in the middle. Um, and through doing these, um, at a certain moment, I, I published this book on, on Bramante. Um, this book I've been writing for a lot of time. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that uh, I consider quite serious, like I spent really 15 years uh, accumulating stuff to do these, and then uh, uh, at a certain moment in 2014, it was the um, anniversary, the anniversary of the death of Bramante, uh, who died in 1514. Uh, and for that, with, uh, with San Rocco, the magazine that Miroslav mentioned before, um, we did a, a so-called Bramante tour. So we took a bus and with some people went to see the entire production of Bramante. And after that, I, I happened to, um, to go and teach for a semester in Chicago. And there I thought, ah, okay, I can conclude this entire pile of, of stuff that I have on this person and, and mm. come out with something. And uh, so I wrote this book, uh, which was published in 2021, I think. So it took still six years. And at that moment, it was really writing, like not, uh, I mean, I, I was still reading, but, but it was no more just the fencing a little bit about the possibility to write, but it was really uh, kind of uh, more systematic. And uh, these are a bit my um, manuscripts, if you want to call it like that, like I'm not able to correct really on a computer, so I would write uh, and then print and then correct by end, and I'm a, a relative, I, I would say I'm a pretty bad writer, but I'm a relatively good editor, so <laughs> I, I'm, I'm good at erasing things. Uh, and I also enjoy it much, much more than writing. Like the, the very painful part of the story for me is when I have to produce, but when I can destroy it, much more interesting. Um, so this looks a bit like this. And I, this was always the paper I had with me. Uh, so I, I was always printing just one side in order to write correction on, on the other side. So that was the bunch of white paper I had with me to draw also things uh, uh, about the work of the office, so projects and so forth. So you will see some of that. And, and the book is a, is a book on architecture, on an architect by another architect. So it's so heavily structured, so there's very much an issue of what goes before, what goes after, uh, section numbering, uh, the, this is first, this is second, and this was done with very obsessive uh, system of numbering, uh, for instance, used by Wittgenstein in writing Tractatus, so one, and then the the, the comment to one is 1.1, 1 .1, uh, the comment to 1.1 is 1.1.1, but if there's a second comment, it's 1.1.1.2, 1 .1 and, and blah, blah, blah. So this was entirely written like that, and then at a certain moment I thought, no, come on, it's too much. It's not a treaty, it's ridiculous, it makes uh, the thing unreadable, so I canceled it, and I think it's much better. Um, so again, so these, for instance, are sketches for an apartment that I think is in the presentation after. So these are sketches for the uh, master plan that you saw before for a scale file. Well, this is family life. Uh, 
violently intruding into science. Um, <laughs> well, I have a lot of these, but of course uh, they are a bit useless. Blah, blah, blah. So these, for instance, are the colors uh, for uh, a model for, com for a project in Fribourg. So th this is a list of RAL codes. But it's very pragmatic. And, and this is the book with uh, uh, very beautiful photos by Bas Prensen, who's a friend with whom I often collaborate. So and this is the final thing. This, the book looks like this. If you want to buy, you go to this thing called that they really do not endorse, but nevertheless called Amazon, and you buy it. So there's two type of pictures, so black and white repertoire pictures, like for instance this one, very beautiful by Piranesi. Yeah, Piranesi, sorry. Uh, by Portuguese, where you can see that the tempietto is perfectly aligned with this palm tree, with, for whatever reason, and uh, generates a very strange effect. Or this picture by standing for Mons. And this, uh, and so there's picture by Bass at the at the beginning and at the end. Um, In, in all of this period, we have been working quite a lot uh, in Tirana. We, we have been involved by the, at the time, mayor uh, some 15 years ago. We did a couple of buildings, like the one you saw at the beginning. And, um, and this is a proposal for a competition for the um, new city hall. Uh, Tirana, the, the urban structure of Tirana is incredibly simple. Uh, there's uh, the only trace of urban organization that existed in the, still in the 90s, is this boulevard designed uh, by the Italian architect uh, Armando Brasini when uh, Albania was occupied by Ita uh, Italy uh, during fascism and uh, and the, the city was very very small like the in in the early like at the end of the 80s the city was still something like 20 30 thousand inhabitants right like, like it's very very small city maybe I'm exaggerating maybe hundred thousand or two hundred thousand but anyhow not not a big city and nowadays it's a city of one million, one million and a half, which is half the population of Albania. Half of the population of Albania lives uh, in Tirana. Uh, still, the main urban structure is this, and the structure goes from this building that is the Polytechnic University to Skanderbeg Square, that is the square where you have the Opera House, uh, the municipality, the National Museum, and so forth. And in between here, there's a pyramid, this building here, now devastated by the refurbishment of MVRVD, but uh, uh, somehow a strange, um, somehow a strange uh, mixture of uh, Niemeyer and sort of post-Stalinist monumentality. Um, interesting thing in itself, and these, uh, that is uh, the uh, National Museum. Uh, National Museum is here, the pyramid is here. This is the um, Skanderberg Square, it has been redesigned uh, uh, very recently by the uh, Belgian office uh, 51 and 4E. A very, very beautiful, uh, one of the most convincing contemporary project in, in Europe, in my opinion, like this uh, very gently sloping, 
pyramid as well, with uh, this large uh, rectangular base, um, which is, uh, I think, excellent, uh, with the only problem that, that there's no shadow at all. So in, uh, in the summer, uh, it, it's impossible to be there. So what we thought is, in designing the new city hall, we would like to to produce something that is not at all in competition with Skanderberg Square and it's uh, um, providing shadow and producing this a completely different calm uh, under shadow environment. So the offices are in a very simple queue. The, the meeting, um, the assembly, and the other meeting area are underground and the entire uh, surface of the plot is covered by a pergola. This. And this is the plan. Um, this thing we did with uh, Johnson Mark Lee from Los Angeles and with Yellow Office, who's a landscape uh, uh, architecture office from Milan. And this is a bit how the pergola plus cube of offices would look like. This is a plan of the underground. Plan of the offices. And you see the alternative in between Scandera Square and the new shadow area. And these are pictures uh, from the street and at night. Um, the, nobody won this competition because actually at the end uh, the city discovered that they didn't own the plot which was owned by the, by the Ministry of Economy or the Ministry of whatever and the Ministry didn't want to give it to the city so nothing happened um, this was just before COVID. This was a study uh, for. Um, this was a study done in collaboration with uh, with many many other agencies like Stefano Boeri Architetti and Michel De Vigne, uh, landscape architects. Uh, this is a study of Geneva. Uh, the Fondation Braillard, which is a foundation in, in Geneva, wanted to imagine uh, the so-called ecological transition. So how Geneva and the, and the French territory next to Geneva, because Geneva is exactly at the border of, of Switzerland, and, and all of the outskirts are still related, like people who live in the outskirts uh, work in Geneva. Um, but they actually live in France. Um, so the, this entire metropolitan area wanted to know uh, how it could develop uh, in a way that was sustainable. And this was pre-COVID, so the, it, it was still... And, and Switzerland is actually a growing uh, country, so all of the different... Uh, cities are growing, so it, the numbers were still pretty, in a way, optimistic about the growth, and at the same time scary because uh, a lot of growth means a lot of pollution, a lot of problems. Um, this research was developed by six, if I remember correctly, different teams in parallel, so it was no competition. It was uh, something that in French is called uh, mandat d'études parallèles, so the, the parallel studies. And um, the other teams were, I don't know, Paula Vigano, Armando, blah, blah, blah. Um, and we uh, decided to focus our attention on very large uh, multinational institutions uh, that have their headquarters in, in Geneva, namely the United Nations and the SAM. And, uh, and we studied a bit the, the two cases. And, uh, and then at a certain moment, we discovered that CERN, and the, the picture you're seeing here are by Armin Linke, and there are picture of CERN on one side, and picture of the Salev, which is a mountain uh, next to Geneva on the, on the 
on the Y. And what we discovered is that, like at the moment, CERN is this thing here. So it uses these underground uh, uh, tunnel uh, where there's this machine called the synchrotron which uh, um, accelerates particles of matter in order to produce collisions in between uh, them. So this thing is called uh, the LHC, the Large Hardon Collider. Um, and this is, uh, I believe, 8 meters in diameter. But the CERN is planning, although nobody knows if they would ever do, is planning a gigantic new uh, ring that would be uh, 100 kilometers uh, in uh, circumference, uh, go across uh, under the lake uh, and allow them to make much more complicated experiments, which once again, I don't know what they um, What was interesting for us, like first of all, when this thing was done, this thing was done in a complete indifference of the city towards the underground tunnel and of the underground tunnel towards the city. So the, the, the underground tunnel you absolutely don't notice because, I don't know if I have a picture here, no. But the, the exits, for instance, are completely unremarkable and normally very ugly uh, utilitarian buildings of the kind you would find in whatever uh, industrial suburbs. Uh, and our suggestion was, if you're digging this thing, maybe this thing could be somehow related to the city in the sense that this thing, it, that will, the, the sand consumes as much energy as the entire city of Geneva. So the sand cannot produce energy for the city. It actually consumes, and it consumes as much. Uh, and this energy, in a very typical French uh, uh, rest of the world deal, is entirely uh, nuclear energy produced uh, in France. So uh, CERN, uh, CERN is populated by a, a population of incredibly dedicated people who are really, really nerds, like, like uh, you cannot beat them at being nerds. And they, they love what they're doing. They, they, they always want to talk to you about collision of particles and how you build up this machine, which is, by the way, a machine that exists only there. So this machine, they are not buying components. They are producing everything. They are the mechanics. Like the people who work there, they're not so much uh, scientists who make hypotheses, because these scientists, they can be in in US or China or wherever and send the mathematical hypothesis and then test it. But the people actually working for CERN are mechanics, like Formula One mechanics who are running this crazy machine and, and they are the only one who can do it because there's no other one uh, in the world. And they are so enthusiastic about it they're also incredibly defensive. So the moment you start to ask them, I don't know, where do you buy the energy to, to run these things? They start to say, uh, what, what, what do you imply? Do you imply that we are not sustainable? Which, by the way, is absolutely true. CERN is absolutely not sustainable. At the same time, I think we all agree that probably it's interesting to investigate uh, uh, quantum physics. That uh, again. So, uh, what we imagine, and not understanding anything, is that this thing is anyhow, in the end, a gigantic underground tunnel. And this underground tunnel can be used to, if not produce, at least distribute energy. So you can imagine that the places where this underground tunnel uh, overlaps with infrastructure on the surface, uh, there could be the new centers of expansion of this city that is expected to grow so much in the next uh, years. So the CERN, the new 
thing becomes again the form of the new city. Of course, it's a form that you will never read, will never see, because it's, the circle is completely underground and, and it doesn't manifest its geometry. But what is interesting is that these completely technical suggestions, for some reason, maybe for geological reason, but I, I don't know, completely matches the reality of the landscape, because it singles out the presence of the uh, Salem in the middle. Uh, and this produces this strange condition of this circle that is strangely, and we don't know why actually, responsive to, to the landscape of on top. And so implicitly it suggests a potential urban figure. Uh, uh, an urban figure for a city that of course is more complex, not only involves Geneva and Lake Geneva, but it also involves start to be so big to involve also Annecy and Lake uh, uh, Annecy. So these are a bit of exploration of this thing that are not so important. Uh, we try to describe uh, these, the final situation by making this 360 degree panorama of, of the city and the metropolitan area as from the top of the Salev, in which you can see all of it. So you see Geneva with the jet d'eau, you see, oh, sorry. So, you see, so this is the underground new uh, synchrotron, of course. This is the old one. This is the airport, this is Geneva with Shadow. This is the, um, I don't remember the name of that mountains. Uh, and these are the Alps. And this is the tip of the uh, Salev with the uh, Téléphérique. And this is already France, so it's old France. So it's probably this is the Mont Blanc. And here, at a certain moment, you will see Lake uh, Annecy and Lake Annecy. So you see, of course, in this representation, the, the new uh, particle collider is aligned. So this is Lake Annecy. And so it is the last tip of the, uh, the salad. Uh, something completely different is, um, well, what, what, what we were interested in these are actually these things, like these tools. And uh, this is an apartment for a very rich Swiss client in Milan. It's a, it's a restoration. Uh, and this was used to be uh, a factory, like a small textile, urban textile factory. And uh, it's a, so it, a very big hole that then became the, um, the studio of a painter. Uh, and then we tried with our project to preserve as much as possible this openness. And so there's these two bands with the toilets and kitchen, blah, blah, blah. And here, toilets and sleeping room with these... Um, wardrobe, that is ear wardrobe, here corridor that gives access to, to the room. So this is a model of the thing and this is the thing, so you see behind there this is the corridor and this is the wardrobe accessible from the corridor and the sleeping rooms are in the other side. So this is done with these tiles uh, that are uh, man-made, like a uh, craftsman in Sicily produced them, because we didn't want to have this uh, sort of super studio effect, because we're not so fond of super studio. Uh, but, but, but nevertheless, we, we some, like, th this is a case of a completely gridded um, uh, 
set of objects which in a way might also refer to a super studio condition. The, the, the white tiles are made to match the size of the existing tiles of the, uh, of the pavement. Um, and this is another um, project for Tirana. Uh, this for the um, forensic police. Our, let's say, our uh, project opportunities, our commissions in, in, in Albania are always a bit strange. Uh, and, and, and this is probably the strangest. Um, I mean, what, what, like the, the, what we, what at least what they told us was that the um, the UK government was uh, available to pay for this building, provided the building would be copied from. Uh, a forensic police uh, uh, building, uh, scientific uh, police building uh, in uh, Belfast. So at a certain moment, I went to Belfast with uh, uh, some representatives of the Ministry of Interior of Albania and, and several policemen to, to see this building that they were supposed to call it. Uh, and we say, okay, it's fine, we copy. Um, the problem was that for security, like two things were interesting. The first interesting thing was that the building was new because uh, it, it had been blown up by IRA uh, not, not too many years ago. That's why they had to rebuild. Uh, and the second was that they could, for security reasons, they could not give us plans. So we should copy. But, uh, so so we, we went there, we saw this building uh, that I'm not even allowed to, to, to show you, I think. Uh, and, um, and this building had stairs at the two sides. And we thought, okay, building with a stair to the side. Um, these are the unbelievably aggressive renderings done by our local partners, which in a way we also like. Uh, and this is the building, so you see the stairs. So the stairs are at the at the oh no. Stairs are there, and there's two entrances. There's corridor in the middle. The the certain depth of these rooms, and um, so that's the building. Once again, extremely simple, extremely realistic with respect to the conditions that were given to us like one one thing that we i i guess a lot of other architects would not like to do this sort of thing because it's borderline offensive for your profession i mean you you need to do the uh, the police and you should copy from that building um we think it's an interesting condition to to experiment but uh I'm not sure everybody would like to do it. Um, and this is the other building we designed. This we had to design like in three months for the police. Both of these projects are now stalled. Who, who knows what's going to happen? But this, this is a very big building that is the headquarter of the Albanian police. And, um, and what I think is really nice is that the building is on top of this existing building that should be demolished and in front of it there's all this area that is empty where I think every police in the world would have told build the building there in the large loan but but in Tirana you you have very strange conditions but you also have a lot of freedom in a way so when we say okay Let's not waste permeable soil again. Let's build where you already have the buildings. They say, okay, 
and uh, and that generated this I believe amazing architectural effect that you have this colossal portico but given that the the loan is higher the, the when you go then down the, the portico looks like an Egyptian temple like a already a ruin that that has been filled up to five meter with sand of the desert which I think is very nice so this is the details of how to do it I don't know what it's a it's a crazily fake building uh, that tries to <coughs> at least enact a, a little bit of uh, uh, save on energy by virtue of this incredible mass. Uh, the, 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 the technological component, as you can imagine, is very low, but we nevertheless try to do buildings that are uh, environmentally as sustainable as possible, given the condition. So we always go back to building very fattish uh, things that at least do not disperse um, energy. Uh, and this is, on the contrary, a very technological, complicated, and hyper-designed building that is a library in Milan. Uh, yeah. It's a competition we won last year, uh, uh, and that uh, they are starting to build. Uh, they started digging this week. Um, but this is a series of references that I skipped. It is also a set of sketches that are not so important. These are important, the proportioning of the facade. So this is the building. The building is made, it's a very simple thing in a way. So it's two naves plus a volume that is the auditorium. The two naves are the two component of the library, the more open uh, part and the, the part of the department that is more like a traditional library. This library uh, is um, uh, the so-called European Library Milan and uh, and it's uh, of course complements a rather articulated set of libraries uh, like the um, um, like the existing one the, the Sormani Library which is in a 16th, 17th century old building uh, and so forth. So this is a library that is much more open to, uh, let's say, um, new media uh, where it's also possible to work and fabricate uh, code software, uh, use a uh, fab lab uh, or rent spaces for podcasting and things like that. So it's not really the library where you only have the books and uh, the northern part of the the northern nave is this more experimental part of the library and the southern one is more traditional if we can say and the two are connected by this platform that you see here uh, that you reach through two very big escalator and then there's the other escalator for the more public part of the, of the library on this side. Um, in section, you enter, no, you enter here, uh, this is the escalator, this is this suspended platform I told you, these are the more public and let's say technologically related part of the building, and this is the more traditional department library, plus a special room on the top here. So the, the program is very complex. The books are here in a, a completely automated uh, gigantic box uh, made of little box that can move along a given structure. And they, like when you need a certain box, so you're searching a book. The book is inside of a box. The box moves up the column and then like wheels, it moves on top of the surface of the, uh, of the deposit and gets to the point where a 
person picks the book and put it into the vertical circulation of the books. Uh, these plane with these little robots running is visible through a few uh, round holes in the pavement. Uh, this is the library from the park to the west. Yes. Uh, this is from the new park that we are designing again together with Yellow Office uh, to the north. No, not a park, like a, a square, also because the, uh, there's the railway under it, so you cannot really have a park there. And this is the back with the uh, entrance here, the entrance to the auditorium. And here you see this large, full height space which is not conditioned. So the system of uh, grids that are screening and wrapping the entire building uh, are determining a condition uh, that uh, uh, it's not too cold, like the, the solar radiation in winter, the, the, these um, this side is towards south, so the solar radiation in winter eats this part that is not conditioned. Uh, and in summer, the air circulation allows not to reach too high temperature. Th this thing is done through very simple set of screens, which are not moving, like they're grids, uh, they're, they're metal grids outside the, um, the, the glass facade. So you see the, the, the facade has this double uh, level. Uh, and this part of the building, these here and these, the, the entrance double eyed floor, is not conditioned. The, this part where you see this uh, glass here and these, this is conditioned, this is conditioned. And they, given that they they are conditioned, they eat or uh, cool the uh, in-between part in the different seasons. So they contribute to eating or uh, cooling the, the great atrium. Uh, this, of course, the, the technology to do it is not so complicated. Uh, so you see here a little bit this screens. So these screens are just grids, and metal grids that are painted in a certain color and, and stay there. But the calculation of the thickness of this grid that changes, but does not change visibly on the different facade, uh, allows to generate this uh, indoor condition uh, that allows to have, uh, uh, let's say, almost one-third of the building uh, unconditioned. Um, this is a bit the uh, bridge. Where the, so you see the escalators here. These are the departments. Uh, this is this bridging element. This is a bookshop. This is a cafe. And these are the other departments. And you see all these area, including the, the top over there, is and not finish. Here you see the round hole that shows you the little machines uh, getting the books uh, underground. And of course, this uh, is a completely different condition. So this is a building that is 30,000 square meter, close to 100 million, more or less, a bit more. Um, and is a condition for experimenting that is totally different from, I don't know, Tirana. Uh, but it's not better and it's not worse and does not necessarily produce better architecture. Uh, it's just different condition, a different challenge. And I think it's possible also to somehow crossbreed the two experiences, to learn something in places where you have to work with much less resources and much less technology. Uh, and bring it back to Western Europe, 
Uh, and at the same time, you can expect exactly because you have so much more money in other contexts, you can experiment something that then can also have consequences uh, in other places. Um, this is the book that. Uh, how are we? Should I stop? Yeah? Okay. Um, again, this is a completely unrelated thing, but maybe related. Um, this is uh, the book I made uh, with my collaborators in Vienna uh, this year. I think it has been presented in June. And this is the result of my um, lessons in Vienna. Um, I was hired by the TU in 2021, I think. And um, and they asked me, no, no they, they didn't ask me, I have to, that's my job, um, I have to uh, um, to do the so-called uh, first uh, um, episode of a thing that's called, Gru no, now it's called Grundlagen des Entwerfens, uh, but uh, uh, used to be called the Grundkurs. So the Grundkurs is a course for the students of the first semester of the first year in which you roughly have to give them an idea what is architecture about. Um, I, like my chair in Vienna, used to be the chair of an architect called Anders Palfi, but before Anders Palfi, it was the chair of Rob Creer. So I investigated a bit what Rob Creer did, and I think to a certain extent is um, this uh, um, the, this class the, the, this, uh, this type of lectures are part like the relics of a project of indoctrination of, of Rob Creer um, so I bought a bit this Creer books and, uh, and the Creer books the the Rob Creer books, the Leon Creer books are different, but uh, the Rob Creer books have this feature that is like the, the next book always incorporates the previous one. So, so it's always the same book that grows in time until it's a book about literally everything. How to design walls, how to design windows, how to design houses, how to design uh, public buildings, how to design cities, how to design public spaces, and so forth. And everything is covered with this very meticulous and elegant drawing. And I thought I could really not do that. And I was also a little bit uh, uh, resistant to, to the topic because I, I just finished writing this book on Bramante. We, we, which is rather, which is a book that doesn't take a direct line to what is architecture. Right? It takes a kind of a detour and it doesn't want to take position on literally every single problem. And most than anything, doesn't want to give a, a recipe. Right? You know, guys, you should do it like that. I don't know. So, again, here I was confronted with the, the possibility to say, Ah, so the Grundkurs, so what is, in very simple terms, architecture, what in very simple terms you should do? So I tried not to do that, and I organized the lectures in this way, like kind of uh, dialectic couples, like this one is called Roof and Wall, and this is the lecture, I, I will not give you the lecture, uh, but it's, it's always made of two pictures, and in each picture, belongs to, to the category, and, and they are always sort of uh, uh, in a relation. And there's, it's always 50, 50 slides, it's PowerPoint. And while doing this PowerPoint, I, uh, th this was my first set of lectures in, in the new school, so I thought, okay, maybe I do it. Uh, 
carefully. So I, I started sketching this thing, like sketching the PowerPoint, like not, not really sketching this building, but literally sketching this image on, on a PowerPoint and just took notes. And, uh, and these are the notes. So see, there's a bit of, uh, of quotes, uh, something I think I should tell the students. And they're not particularly nice drawing. I mean, look at this penguin. Where's the penguin? Where's the penguin? <coughs> ah, yeah. That's horrible. Um, and uh, yeah, it's like the, I don't know what to add. It's been by far the easiest book I, I ever made once we had all this uh, uh, A4 paper. We scanned them. Um, I, I wrote an introduction and that the book. Um, and yeah, and I also didn't want to uh, to to write in uh, uh, with, with, with a proper typeface the text because that seemed to me like like this thing are a bit silly and 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 a bit of a oversimplification. So if they are handwritten and in a way it's not even entirely possible to read them. I think it's okay. So they, they should give an idea. I think they should provide the students with a perception of the problem. Uh, they should, I think, particularly the, the PowerPoint that they see, should provide with some visual material that, that they can start to use to build their own personal background. Uh, but it shouldn't be uh, more like that. So this is it. And this is the last thing. This is what we are actually doing now. So we're doing a republication of Fischer von Erlach and Wurf, Final Historische Architektur, which was uh, published in 1721. So two years ago, it was the 300. Uh, year's anniversary, uh, so we did a, a symposium in Vienna, uh, and uh, um, mm -hmm. so and now we are republishing the book. Uh, this is uh, uh, the cover and back cover. Uh, at the moment, is is not available unless you really want to buy the. 19th century reprint that are this size. Uh, there's only a, a very small uh, a reprint published in Darmstadt in the late 70s. So we do it a little bit bigger uh, so that you can read and there's a translation, uh, an English translation because the original is in German and French. Uh, and uh, and these we hope to present uh, just before Christmas in Vienna. Uh, but this is actually a, a republication. So, and together with that, uh, uh, at TEU, we're doing this research on similar conditions, similar wonders, like buildings that you would not expect to exist, but which actually do exist in the contemporary world. Like things like uh, this is the uh, the Church of Saint Simon and uh, the Mokatam Hills in Cairo for the Coptic uh, minority, which is dig into the rock. And there's this beautiful, be beautiful or not beautiful, uh, um, bas reliefs that have been made in the 70s. So they're made with the sledgehammer. Uh, and uh, well, these are some. So this is the city of the death in Karb. No, Najaf, I think it's Najaf. Yeah. Uh, and this is Karbala, where the, uh, the shrine of uh, Imam Uzayin uh, is located, but has been almost entirely rebuilt in recent years. Um, this is, for instance, the. Batu caves in uh, um, Kuala Lumpur, and uh, this is a stair going into a rock, into a rock, into a cave, into a rock, 
where all these Hindu temples are located. And this is a, there's a celebration called the Taipusam uh, that's celebrated by the Tamil minority in Malaysia, uh, where I went last year. So we went last year, and uh, and you climb all the like the the believers climb all these. 272, I believe, steps with uh, either a pot of milk on, on the shoulder or with very, very bulky uh, little, uh, how to say, little temple made, made of wires and, and iron uh, that, that they carry in an act of uh, penitence. Um, this is the... Um, reconstruction of St. Peter that is in Yamusukro in Cote d'Ivoire that has been built in the 80s for uh, the at the time uh, president of Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Félix Apoué Boignier, if I'm not wrong. Um, but anyhow, th it doesn't really matter um, what these are. These sort of things exist. Like we tend to think that these things are pre-modern that has been completely disappeared from, from the world, but actually it's not true. There's a lot. I mean, these are just an example. And what we're doing is simply going there, documenting, redrawing, and yeah, assembling them. So this is a project that's called Wonders of the Modern World, uh, which is next uh, uh, book I will probably do. That's it. Thank you. Oh, of course, if you have questions, I am happy to try to answer. That'll be the first question, and thank you for your lecture. It was uh, super interesting. Um, I want to ask you just a basic one. Why did you choose uh, Bramante actually for such a long research? Uh, so there should be like a history for it. Um, well, Bramante is pretty good architect, first of all. Uh, the, the second thing is Bramante, and, and this is something that, that for instance, Gay Müller, who, who's the most important historian of Bramante uh, in the 19th century, writes, is that Bramante is more important than the other Italian Renaissance architects because he, he took the biggest risk. So, uh, Bramante, we, we don't know exactly how the thing went, but uh, at a certain moment, Julius II decides to demolish St. Peter and rebuild. Uh, it was possible to restore St. Peter. Uh, and the question appeared already many times, and for instance, Don Battista Alberti says it's foolish not to restore it and not to be reasonable also with this church. Um, and then somehow, all of a sudden, one day, uh, Julius II let people dig the foundation of, of a new piece of the church, it goes down into, into this foundation, that is, there are the reports of the, of the people, um, of, the, of the curia, the, the, the clerks, the high-ranking clerks, saying that he was going down into the mud and wanted someone else of the bishop to to go down as well and everybody said mm, oh and and that's the foundation of St. Peter that's where they put down the, this coin by Caradosso probably uh, drawn by Bramante and uh, and we don't really know who took the decision if it was just uh, Julius II or if it was uh, Bramante who pushed it. 
But anyhow, it's this crazy gamble. Because immediately after, what we know is that Bramante smashes the old church without mercy. So in a way that it becomes immediately clear that there's no way back. And, and, you, and, and all of the people and the papal administration write that, but in, in kind of secret diaries write, you know, this thing is not going well. This thing doesn't make sense. It's also a, a shift of power uh, from uh, the church being legitimized by all of the relics, all of the memory that were accumulated in the old St. Peter. It's even, even Vasari writes, yeah, Bramante could, could have been a bit more uh, attentive to all the relics that were there. And this shift, which means uh, shifting also from a church legitimated through um, historical documents, uh, erudition, uh, Anyhow, power of certain type of professional moves to being legitimated through architectural spectacle, uh, which is what is really annoying for all these professions. And they all, like the, the administration of the church, like the, the high ranking, like the, the deep state, uh, if you want to call it like that, really dislike the but somehow Bramante manages to, to demolish so much that you, you cannot go back. And, and then he died. Like, they both died. Like, uh, Julius dies in 1430 and, and Bramante in 1414. And uh, in 15, sorry, 1513 and 1514. And, uh, and then there's several generations of architects who have to solve the problem. To the point that Michelangelo, who becomes architect of St. Peter much later, in the 40s, if I'm not wrong, when he's 75, if I'm not wrong, uh, takes this uh, job as a way to reduce as much as possible the, the construction in order to finish with this story who, who, who generates so many problems. Just to mention, uh, three of the 95 theses by Martin Luther are dedicated to St. Peter. It's stupid to do this church uh, for this reason. And then another one, it's stupid to do this church for this reason. And it's stupid to ask for so much money to poor Germans to build this stupid church. And uh, this is not to say that the Protestant reformation took place because Bramante demolished too much. No, the, 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 the story is certainly more complex. But for sure, the St. Peter, the construction of St. Peter has been the main propaganda uh, topic of Protestant reform. Like, by far, number one. And uh, so... Bramante takes a risk and takes a responsibility that places his own work in a slightly different terrain, a terrain in which architecture really touches into power and, and, and touches into politics very heavily, and he takes risks that others would not have taken. Actually, all of the debate, except Bramante, like, not only the people after, but as I was saying, even the people before, like Alberti, say, no, no, no. This is uh, it, too aggressive as an idea. Uh, this is now um, entering into a field that should not be the field of architecture. You cannot ask so much money uh, just in order to prefigurate a possible... Yeah, form of to represent a possible uh, community life. Uh, if you take architecture as such, as representation of a possible community. And you get to the problem of uh, the representation of a possible community actually backfiring into the organization of the present. 
so that's why I think it's much more interesting than, than other architects who are much more nice in a way and, and much less problematic. It's, the other thing is that Bramante left us um, five drawings, or a bit more. But okay. So, and, and everything he did, he didn't manage to control entirely. So he never finished the building, something collapsed. Uh, he, he, he didn't got, like, there, there's very little things that are entirely designed Maybe San Satiro in Milan uh, and the Tempietto in Rome. So you are left with a lot of space for imagination. You, you can figure out the Bramante you prefer, uh, we, we, which helps uh, if you, in a way, want to write things uh, uh, through someone else. I think this is very explicit in the book, so it's not that I'm now revealing all. Oh, that uh, no, uh, it's very simple, simply stated uh, at the beginning. Yeah, do, do you want? Maybe just related to your very last slide with the cows and to the name of your office. I'm just curious, why is it called Bauku? <laughs> uh, that does really no explanation. Like it's, it's like kind of a fake German. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and silly fake German. Thanks for the lecture. Um, um, I was wondering about the project with the cemetery in Milan you showed, and I'm sorry if you uh, already said that and I, and I didn't notice, but I was wondering uh, if I understood well that the, the whole area around the railways are now like the rail, rail, like railways brownfield. Mm -hmm. And um, I was wondering that there was a competition and uh, part of it you designed this high line bridge or whatever it mm -hmm. is. And the northern part, uh, or like the northern park, um, was that also part of the competition or that was designed by someone else? And whether the new big buildings, the towers, whether they were already there and the park and the connection to the other side was somehow planned uh, like post uh, like afterwards, or if it's the whole development plan somehow together that, I don't know, someone is planning the towers and therefore someone also designed the park uh, yeah. between the towers and the railways. So basically what was the process and what, who were the stakeholders? Um, stakeholders are the owners. Uh, at little more than the owners, because the city decided to um, to have the competition organized by, um, by actually the owner of the area. So yes, the city was theoretically involved, but I think uh, there were better ways of uh, um, maintaining control of the public uh, uh, over this decision. Um, nevertheless, this is what you can do if you work nowadays. So this is the sort of competition you can do, and, and we do. Um, the, the design is entirely ours, of the team. The team was complex, it was not only us, it was us, it was on-site, it was another office in Milan, uh, Chris Gantenbein, who was an office space. That, in Basel, uh, Atelier Kempetil, who is an office based in Rotterdam. Uh, I'm probably forgetting some. Um, Lola Landscape Architect. Um, yes, no, we designed all, all of the thing. Like the. Uh, 
I, I think it's clear. Like what, what's inside the green border is the competition area. And, and we, we designed this residential neighborhood, this other residential neighborhood, these towers, these offices, this other residential neighborhood. But then the, this bridge connecting the, uh, the two sides and connecting with this uh, uh, existing uh, platform on top of the, of the cemetery. Um, it's only a matter of hierarchy. The, the competition has to, to design a new park, and we thought this is the new park, this is the fort, and then the, the, the development are connected to the different uh, neighboring uh, urban tissue. <coughs> but again, we lost the competition uh, probably exactly because of that, like because we uh, concentrated on the public part of the thing and not so much on. Uh, yeah, towers, uh, which are there. <laughs> yeah, please. Uh, I'd like to ask on the visuality of your proposal, this project is from Milano to Tirana. They were designed or uh, drawn very specific to a style. Could so, uh, you tell us about the inspiration of the project? Well, that, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, of course, uh, that has to do with two issues. One, one issue is the issue of an audience. Uh, and I would say our audience in, uh, uh, in Tirana um, is actually the prime minister directly. So it, it, it's a type of relation that's really like Renaissance. You, you go to the prince and, and you show your drawing. And if you like, it's okay, otherwise not. Um, in Milan, it's, of course, a commission of many people. Some are experts, some are not. And, uh, and it's also an issue of money. Like in, in Tirana, we, we get very, very low payment for this project. So it would be, I mean, we, we would not have the resources, for instance, to simply hire uh, a rendering people to do renderings uh, for that. So um, again, th this belongs to, to these uh, um, different uh, conditions of, of the different uh, architectural opportunities. Um, but it's also true that we, for instance, in this case, we, we decided to, to keep our renderings as abstract uh, as possible. And we invested a lot of effort and energy and also a bit of money in doing this model, uh, which, uh, which maybe was wrong um, decision in terms of communication. So there's no real recipe from from our side, but but the decision on on uh, representations are not so different from the decision about the the architecture. So they are context specific every every time, and I I would say we we actually speak a lot about how to represent the project. Uh, we maybe speak even more about how to represent the project uh, in the office than about the project itself. Um, this is maybe an Italian disease that... Uh, yeah. I want to see if there was. Yeah, here you see, like for instance, in these cases, there's two competition, one in Berlin and one in Geneva. In this case, we built entire models, like really big, particularly the, the one in Geneva. It's, it's very big and very detailed, 
just to take picture and then miserably lose the competition. Uh, so, and then it also depends also on uh, on uh, also on our personal life. We are doing this a bit less now because we are more old and more bored uh, by well, what we're doing. So you need a lot of enthusiasm to to make a gigantic model just to take a picture. Uh, and at a certain moment, that enthusiasm disappears, uh, which is not only bad also that, because you, you gain some awareness of, um, yeah, context. Like, for instance, 15 years ago, I would never accept it to do renderings for, for competition. Uh, now we do, that's, that's, you can do good renderings. In the meantime, people doing renderings became also much better. And actually... 2023 renderings are much more convincing than 2008 renderings. So, and it's also it also became super professional. So, you don't do yourself; you give it to someone else to do it, and uh, and all of a sudden, I think it's interesting. Uh, while in 2000, I don't know, 2010, I would absolutely refuse the idea of doing. Uh, renderings. Yeah. Maybe I have one question on the Brahma mm -hmm. Why Brahma today? Why what is from Brahma Why to be today? Is it the space? The book is quite a lot of space. Yeah. Is it the space? Oh, also a lot of the pragmatism, the capacity to never claim, okay, this has already been done, let's adjust it. Uh, yeah. No, I, 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 I have an interest for, for Bramante also because of that, this extreme pragmatism, the fact that there's no signature. I think if we, if we would have no... Uh, <coughs> no written documents telling us so clearly that the architect who designed Santa Maria in San Satiro in Milan in uh, 1480s is the same architect who designed the Pietro di San, Mon San Pietro in Montorio in Rome in the 1505s. Uh, most likely we would think they are two different articles, uh, we, which I think is really nice uh, compared to, uh, to the post-romantic idea of the artist as this kind of genius who looks into his earth and <laughs> discover and creates uh, um, in this uh, extreme authenticity. I, I like a lot the fact there's zero authenticity in Bramante and it can look like something in a certain place and look completely different in another place. But the intelligence that is operating is always uh, extremely sophisticated and extremely curious and open-ended and also, I think, uh, extremely witty, maybe, maybe a bit cynical, but, but certainly... Uh, with a lot of sense of humor. So yeah, that that's another reason. Uh, like the, the, the interest in space, the pragmatism, the capacity of doing with what was available, and the, the complete lack of uh, authorship in a way. Uh, this I think is something that is obvious from my position because I I work in an office like I. I'm a partner in an office with other people, so we have to do a little bit without authorship uh, to a certain extent. Thank you for that. Uh, next week there will be
be um, collected from Berlin uh, floating university. So I will be happy if you come again also to next week. Same time. Thank you.